But let's uh, let's talk about chapter 19, contrast media and special radiographic techniques. So in general, what we're talking about now is IV contrast stuff. So in the last lecture, we're talking more about uh, contrast uh, within the GI system. Now we're talking about contrast for basically every other system in the body. So and again, I, I'm sorry these objectives keep cutting off, but we want to name four types of contrast media. Talk about examples. Talk about adverse things that can happen when we use contrast. How to get a good history of a patient specific to IV contrast administration for what we call iodinated contrast media. Um, what's our role for things like a urogram, which is the primary <coughs> form of contrast exam that you would still do in x-ray. Um, but I would pay particular attention today if you're interested in surgery or if you're interested in CT because we use contrast quite a bit. The key terms that we've got, uh, I almost got all of them on here. They go the additional to, once we get down to uh, nephrogram, there's osmolality, stent, and viscosity. Osmolality and viscosity are particularly important. All right, the very first thing that we'll talk about is air. Air can be used as a, what we call a negative contrast agent. Um, so we use this uh, all the time when we ask the patient to take a deep breath in and hold it. We're filling the lungs with a negative contrast agent, the air. Right? Um, so it will cause things to appear darker than the surrounding structures. So in the case of a chest x-ray, it's going to cause the lungs to appear darker than the bony thorax. We do occasionally use this in arthrography and myelography if a patient's allergic to iodinated contrast. Do y'all remember what is myelography from your reading? What is it? Yes, instilling contrast into the spinal cord. So what I just said is we do sometimes inject air into the spinal cord pretty crazy yeah um, it would be very painful uh, we like co2 particularly if we are using air in a uh, enema situation co2 is going to be much more comfortable for the patient right um, using room air causes uh, even more uh, spasms and uh, cramps within the bowel but generally when we talk about contrast media, we're talking about iodinated contrast, right? Using iodine. And we call this a positive contrast agent because it's going to show up wider um, compared to surrounding structures. It will be brighter on the image, right? Um, most of these things are fluid um, and they mix readily with uh, blood and bodily fluids so we can inject them into an IV, they'll just join the bloodstream and pass through the bloodstream to whatever organ we're trying to look at. The reason we like iodine so much on page uh, 352 is because of its high atomic number. It has a high, it has, a, you don't need to know what that atomic number is right now, but it's 53, it's high. And that means it attenuates more x rays. So it's called metalloid. Where basically, what I've just said is it's a metal-like substance that we can inject into the bloodstream. So it will absorb x-rays like a metal would, but we're allowing it to go places <clears throat> like your kidneys. So the main characteristics of this are summed up here on this slide. Um, and each one of these has an impact on the patient's care. The first thing is osmolality, and that's um, the number of particles in solution. In the most part, everything that we use in the hospital now is a low osmolality contrast media, an LOCM. That means that it has roughly twice the osmolality of blood. It has roughly twice the number of particles per solution as blood. And that's a good thing, right? The reason for that is that if we start to increase that osmolality, it can cause changes in the way the blood's flowing through the patient, right? 
Um, <clears throat> in particular, we would be concerned if we were using a high osmolality contrast media, that means it has roughly seven or more times the amount of particles per solution as blood, that can cause some uh, neurological response. Ionic versus non-ionic. Everything that we use now is non-ionic. Non-ionic. So it's a non-ionic iodinated contrast media. The word ionic and iodinated are talking about totally different things. Iodinated means it has iodine in it. And iodine is an element on the periodic table. Ionic is referring to whether or not it dissolves into charged particles in solution. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're talking about injecting something into my body, I would prefer the thing that is not going to dissolve into charged particles in my bloodstream, right? But back in the day, we used to inject ionic contrast media into the patients, and they would, surprise, surprise, react to it, right? So, um, those reactions could be pretty severe. The reason I mention that is if you have a patient, an older patient, and they mention that they've had a reaction to contrast media, the very first thing I ask them is, when was that given to you? If they say 1980 something or 1970 something, I know it was probably an ionic contrast media which had a much higher risk of reaction. So I can, clear, I can tell them, listen, we use very different substances now that do not cause the same level of reaction as what we used to use in the 70s and 80s. So we like the, the non-ionic stuff because they do not break down into charged particles. The third thing that we look at is the viscosity. And this is like the fluid friction. The way that I think about viscosity is, is how sticky is it, right? How sticky is it? So think about this stuff as being kind of like Coca-Cola. If you pour Coca-Cola on the counter, what's going to happen to the counter? It gets sticky, right? If you pour ion, um, iodine contrast on your machine, your machine will be sticky, right? So we are putting something very sticky inside of the patient's bloodstream. You can imagine that could cause some problems, particularly if we look at things like the kidneys, which are responsible for getting rid of sticky things inside of the body. So what are the precautions we need to follow in using this stuff <clears throat> to minimize any adverse reactions? First thing is CYA, right? Get an informed consent, right? Now, in general, when a patient shows up for procedures at a hospital, they're required by the front desk to sign an informed consent form, right? Or some kind of waiver or consent form. But anytime we're doing a, a specific procedure, we need to get what we call informed consent, where the patient's been explained, this is what the, the procedure entails, and you're agreeing that your doctor ordered this and that you're okay with doing it. Now, if they have a lot of questions about it, why are we doing this? What's this about? Why are you using this stuff? Blah, 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 blah. That is a really good time to refer them back to their physician. The ordering physician technically is the one responsible with explaining this procedure to the patient and why the procedure is important, in theory. That oftentimes simply doesn't happen. In this busy world, they just say, hey, you need to go get this IV contrast exam. And the patient then wanders off into your department and has a bunch of questions that they thought about in the course of their wanderings of the earth, right? Um, so make sure that you've at least gotten them signing something that says that they were okay with you doing what you were going to do. Then we want to get a medical history, right? And this is specifically focused on allergies. So what types of allergies have they, have they had in the past? Do they have a big long list of allergies? They're allergic to everything, including sunlight. Um, and then also questions about whether they have diabetes, whether they have high blood pressure, things like that. We need to know about those things and we need to check their kidney function by checking a BUN and creatinine because again, BUN and creatinine let us know whether the kidneys are going to be working to get rid of the sticky stuff that we're about to give the patient. Two things that I'll point out on these uh, preparation things. On page uh, 359, both these yellow boxes are great. I think I've said it once, but I'll say it again. 
always flush out your catheter prior to giving any kind of injection. Flush it out with normal saline. Um, this avoids any kind of incompatibility of different medications that might be there at that needleless system. The other thing is we like uh, the lab tests of BUN and creatinine. The book indicates that a creatinine level of two milligrams uh, per DL is the kind of the cutoff, the contraindication. I would say it's probably below that. Every facility I've worked at, it's been 1.3 or 1.5, something less than that. Two would be an absolute, like, don't do it. Um, on page 360, I have written not necessarily on this yellow box. I question whether or not this one is the case. Um, this is under some scrutiny right now about whether or not patients should be instructed to discontinue taking metformin after CT or contrasted exams. Um, the ACR, the American College of Radiology's opinion right now is don't. Don't discontinue it. Just continue taking it like normal. But I would say rely on your facility's procedure protocol. And if you have additional questions, feel free to talk to me about it. Um, but as you can see, we want to verify those medications like metformin. Anything that's used to treat type 2 diabetes um, is working on, based on the function of the kidneys. All right. So here's a more exhaustive checklist. And this is similar to uh, the type of form that you might see in a healthcare facility prior to uh, that you might, once you're getting uh, patient's informed consent and you're getting their medication history, these are the types of questions we generally ask. Um, kidney function, metformin, uh, heart disease, disease and hypertension, and we're going to check their blood pressure, right? I highly recommend that, like underline that. That's a really good idea. Um, I am stressing that because I worked in the field for like 10 years before I realized how significant blood pressure was. And what I did was I started taking the blood pressure myself within the department prior to doing any kind of injection. And I actually found about once every other month or so, there were patients who just by the basis of their blood pressure did not need to be receiving any kind of IV injection, right? They had a really high blood pressure, and it turns out that had more to tell the doctor about their headache than anything else, anything that I was gonna do. And I would just be adding to it if I gave them an injection, right? So. I would encourage you to check blood pressure. Um, if you're working with an ER patient in one of our facilities, write it down, write what their last blood pressure was on their monitor. It's helpful information to have. If something goes wrong, it's one of the first things that we're gonna be looking at to see how bad things are going. Have they had iodine contrast in the past 48 hours, past 24 hours? Those are important for the physician to know because we might need to change what we're doing. Um, history of allergy, history of asthma, previous contrast media reaction, and, and this goes back to yes. If yes, what agent and what reaction? When, when did this happen? What happened, et cetera? Um, and then one thing to notice particularly is whether they're using beta blockers or antihypertensive medications. Why would I care if they're using beta blockers? I've said that their blood pressure is important. What does a beta blocker do? Put on your critical thinking caps and think with me. Good. All right. Contrast media reactions. These can range from mild to severe. There is very few predictors. I wouldn't say there's no predictors, but there's very few predictors. There are a few um, things that seem to correlate with a person having a contrast reaction. One is if they have a high number of allergies, right? Um, you know, an, another is if they have compromised um, kidney function, right? All of these things seem to lead to it. Anxiety also seems to have some connection to it. So a good protocol is to use a small amount and then wait and check for signs and symptoms. We can do that within the radiography department. We can inject a small amount, hand inject it, and then follow up. If a patient is at risk 
<clears throat> they need to receive a premedication protocol, like what we talked about the other day, where they receive a certain amount of Benadryl prior to showing up at the department, and then maybe some prednisone right before the exam. There's an example of that in the other chapter. All right, mild contrast reactions. I like that this is broken down like this. Um, warmth, flush, metal taste, coughing, nausea, feel like they wet their pants. We're going to call those mild things, and almost everyone experiences it. Um, I would not say it's altogether unpleasant, right? Um, I've had contrast injections myself, and I just felt warm, and it felt like I had been embarrassed, but I hadn't actually been embarrassed. Like, my face turned red, but I was like, I didn't do anything. Like, I didn't say anything. Why is my face red? And then it went away. It was just kind of a goofy feeling. All right, moderate. Erythema, does anyone know what that means? Redness of the skin, right? Um, your decaria is hives or itching, right? Bronchospasms are scary, right? It's the feeling like something's, you can't quite catch your breath, right? Um, we're calling that a moderate contrast reaction, right? So we just moved up a level in the hot sauce spectrum. Um, these can be treated with an oral antihistamine and occasionally a bronchodilator, but generally we treat it with the IV or oral Benadryl. We monitor the patient, watch their blood pressure. If his blood pressure is not dropping, if their SATs are normal, they will kind of come out of it. What did you say the second one was? Oh, okay. Your is hives. Hives or itchy feeling on your skin, generally around the area of the injection. That sounds not fun. It's really weird. Like you said, it can be like associated with vasovagal reactions. Um, this is weird stuff. Um, vasovagal. This is kind of, um, I always imagine those old movies or whatever where the lady faints, you know, um, you know, because, she, you know, what just happened was so, was too much for her tender sensibilities or whatever. Um, that is a vasovagal reaction. Um, so, uh, um, difficulty breathing, ex uh, low heart rate, loss of, uh, um, <coughs> low blood pressure, decreasing blood pressure, patient can pass out. Um, so that's why we've got them in Trendelenburg, right? So we'll continue to check that blood pressure. In order to avoid having them pass out, we will lower their head, raise their feet, right? Again, at this point, we should have gotten a physician involved. By the time we got to the, the medium contrast reaction, we need to have a physician involved communicating with them, hey, I think this person's having a contrast reaction, I checked their blood pressure, it appears normal, and uh, let's get some, uh, they'll come in and they'll, they'll do the Benadryl. All right, severe stuff. Not, uh, not included on this list, but it should be is death. Um, we're gonna call these anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reactions. Um, so, it starts out, oftentimes, in the, it, what seems very innocuous, but with a sneeze. And the patient will sneeze, and then they'll say, I can't breathe, or they struggle to make noise come out of their mouth, like they can't talk all of a sudden. Um, so, tingling sensations, dysphagia, that's difficulty swallowing. Laryngeal and bronchial edema, so swelling along the larynx and the bronchus is really scary stuff. Respiratory arrest, of course, is scary stuff. Cardiac arrest, seizures. So pretty bad stuff. Uh, your job is to call the code and to get um, to work to get the crash cart in there, and the physician and the nurses will work to administer epinephrine to reverse what's going on. 
people can come back from it. It's a little scary for a little while. Um, one thing that you can do in addition to getting the crash cart and materials is start being the recorder. R write down what's happening. We got a blood pressure at 0900 hours. At uh, 0902, we gave the patient however much epinephrine, right? At 0900, um, 10, we check the blood pressure again, it returned to normal. All of those are charted out here on page 361. So if you have, uh, if you're wondering where that's at in your textbook, it's there. Well, so what exactly do you do? Well, you don't do a lot anymore. Like I said earlier, a lot of this stuff has been farmed out to CT. Um, but <clears throat> things that we do is basically two studies of the kidneys and the urinary system. The first is what we call an excretory urogram, and it's not nearly as bad as it sounds. Um, so generally, the, like if we're being fancy and we're using all of our, you know, jargon, we'll call it an IVP or an IVU, right? Um, what this means is intravenous something, we're injecting contrast, and then we're taking pictures of either the kidneys, that would be the pilogram, or the kidneys and ureters, that would be the urogram, okay? Um, they're saying it's not appropriate given the nature of the study, but it's what everyone calls it, right? Um, basically what we're looking at, and they might also call it a nephrogram, just meaning a picture of the kidneys. What we're looking at is on page 362, you get these pretty pictures of the kidneys, ureter, and bladder. It also is a functional exam, so it allows us to see just how functional are the kidneys. Um, are they picking up the contrast quickly? Uh, and, you know, how, how quickly is it moving through the urinary system and being excreted? Bear in mind that if they've had a kidney transplant, there will be a third kidney in a different location, generally somewhere in the pelvis. That's if they are the recipient. Cystography, this is um, imaging the internal contours of the bladder. So if there's a sus suspicion of bladder cancer or something like that. Um, we do a retrograde filling of the bladder um, with a water-soluble contrast media. So we, use, we have a urinary catheter generally that's already been placed, we inject contrast media through the urinary catheter into the bladder, right? Um, we want to make sure that we are following sterile procedures when we do this, because we are causing retrograde filling of the bladder. Um, and if there's any difficulty in voiding after that, we could be potentially uh, putting the patient at risk for infection. So we then, once we've got that retrograde filling of the bladder, we will examine it under fluoroscopy. Voiding cystourethrogram, we still do this a little bit. The idea being we'll fill the bladder with contrast and then we'll have the patient void and we'll see, are they able to void completely? So here's that uh, cystogram. For the most part, we are not doing these as much as we used to. Um, they were valuable at one point in time, but pretty much every patient who receives an abdomen and pelvis CT scan, they do what's called a bladder scan at the end of the CT scan where they, they take a quick picture of the, the contrast-filled bladder. Retrograde urography, <clears throat> this is about as fun as it sounds. We are going to now create enough pressure right within uh, the urinary system to backflow the ureters into the kidneys, right? Um, now where this is most often used now is in, study, in surgery of while they're doing the kidneys, some kind of surgery on the kidneys. So they'll use this to guide the surgical procedure itself. So we place a catheter into the ureter, right? So we have to go up the urethra through the bladder to the ureter, place a catheter inside the ureter, and backflow the ureter with contrast. So it generally does require some kind of surgical guidance. Um, so this 
has a lower risk of contrast reactions than IV contrast administration, right? Because we've circumvented the entire circulatory system. So there's a retrograde study. Okay, again, this is another thing that is generally done um, in surgery. I've actually never seen an intravenous cholangiogram in my life, but in the past, they used to do a contrast injection and then they could study the biliary duct system. That's contrast injection. Generally, this is now done using ultrasound MRI or CT. But where we still do something like this is in the operating room where we have a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography, right? Why in the world would we do this? Well, we are doing this to look at the biliary system generally after the gallbladder has been removed. So they've gone in laparoscopically, which means they've made little tiny incisions on the patient's uh, belly they filled their gut with gas so they can move these little surgical arms around inside of them. And they've clipped off the gallbladder because it has stones in it and it's causing pain and possible risk for infection. They clip off the gallbladder, they remove the gallbladder, and then they review the biliary system to make sure that they didn't nick another part of the gallbladder of the drainage system, that the drainage system's closed off where it needs to be closed off and it's still flowing where it needs to be flowing that there's not a stone stuck in the drainage system, right? They look at all those types of things prior to closing up the patient. So you're there in the operating room operating one of those C-arm devices as they inject IV contrast into the biliary tree, into the, all the branches of the bile system, and you're, tr you're tracing out are there any stones there or is there anything that's been cut. And you will find stones, and you will occasionally find where the surgeon nicked an area of it, and it needs to be repaired. So it is a very helpful part of the OR team. Um, so the risk is then leakage of bile into the peritoneal cavity, which would basically turn you into a pickle. All right. Like pickle Rick. <laughs> All right. So again, that's the surgical study, and we're there trying to make sure that the, what the fancy word is patency of the ducts, right? That they, the ducts are draining appropriately. I wouldn't get lost in the weeds of all these different T-tube, whatever, perforated post cholecystectomy stuff. Don't worry about that, right? Just know that we're evaluating to see if the, the bile ducts are working. Here's an example of what that looks like, and that's why I call it the biliary tree. You can see all the branchings of that collecting system. That is not a circulatory system. That is not blood. It is a bile system. It is a bile drainage system. It is draining something that smells like pickles, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it. No, I like it. Through the ampulla of Vader, which is probably my favorite anatomical name in the body, the drainage point of the bile ducts into the small bowel. Oh Lord, the ERCP. So if we want to get really fancy, right, we can use fiber optic cables, right, and we can run those through an endoscope, right, down to the ampulla of Vader. So what am I talking about? Running something down the patient's throat, a scope, that then extends down, right, with a little fiber optic cable through the stomach, through the duodenum to the ampulla of Vader, right? We access the ampulla of Vader that way with the little scope, and then we inject contrast up the biliary system, and at that point, everyone's starting to wonder, have we lost our minds, right? Um, but this will allow us to see um, the entire bile system um, and whether or not, again, whether there's a stone there or something like that. Um, this seems kind of like overkill. If you're curious what you feel like when you're having this done, it's on page 366. This woman is not acting, I don't think, and it looks miserable.
<clears throat> okay, other fun things we can do. The fun's not over yet. We can take contrast and we can inject it into your spinal canal, right? Um, I'm not talking about injecting it into the spinal cord. That would be a really bad idea. I think uh, I saw one of these when I uh, shattered. Really? It, let me pause. What we do for this procedure is we're trying to look at the spinal canal and something that might not show up because the patient's had a prior surgery, there's metal, there's been a laminectomy, something's not allowing us to see everything that we need to see, or po potentially a tumor, disc herniation. So um, like we've said, we're gonna have the patient on the fluoro table. We will insert under fluoro guidance a very fine needle into the spinal column, right? Um, or the spinal canal. And the idea being, if you can imagine the spine being like a, an extension cord, what we're perforating is just the insulation around the extension cord. We're not perforating the wires, right? Um, and that's where the term spinal cord comes from, is it has an insulating strip around it we go through the insulation and we inject basically into that cavity of insulation. Um, generally, we do not do these just um, under fluoro. After we've got the, we know that we're in the spinal cord, we instill some contrast that's either visible on CT or MRI. So we use these in conjunction with CT generally. Um, and so your patient, as soon as you're done with them, you'd be escorting them to CT. The other thing that we occasionally do is arthrography. And so this just means into a joint, most commonly the shoulder joint. And so what you do again is under fluoro guidance, the doctor is going to, they'll use lidocaine, numb up the area. They will insert an, a needle into the joint space um, and they will uh, inject contrast into the joint space. They're trying to see is the joint space been torn? Is there a problem within the joint space um, or what have you and I've never seen them use air I've just seen them use ionated contrast media and again typically the patients then taken over to MRI or to CT for additional images afterwards so we kind of assist on the front end <clears throat>